Freerin saved my life. That's what I would say if I were one of the hundreds of video essayists who are scrambling to make their Sosonofrian videos. And while a lot of them seem to be making clickbaity titles about how this anime cured their cancer, saved the puppy, brought world peace, and made communism work, I want to take a more analytical approach towards analyzing this anime and go over the creative decisions that the writer and the show's director made to create more depth and meaning in their stories, so that other writers and filmmakers can learn to do the same. But even if you're not a creative, there is still a lot of value in learning this kind of analysis to better understand and articulate how a piece of media succeeds or fails in what it's trying to achieve. A lot of the YouTube videos on Freerun that I've seen tend to praise the show on a rather superficial level. They typically seem to just summarize the story and give their feelings on it, praising the things they liked or moments that affected them the most, which is fine, but with a show that has so many intricate details and use of storytelling techniques, that level of analysis almost seems sacrilegious. I think we can do better. I think there's a lot more to discuss not just about Freerun, but about writing and analyzing stories better. Hopefully, I can explain my methodology, how I engage with writing and visual media, and what I look for when I rate their quality. I expect most of you have already watched Soso no Freerun. If you haven't, go watch it or at least the first four episodes to get most out of this video. But yes, this is a spoiler warning for the entire series. <laughs> So, how does one go beyond writing? To answer this question, one has to be able to detect and read the subtext. For those who don't know, subtext is a hidden story or meaning behind the text. While the text is everything on the page or shown on screen, subtext requires a level of interpretation, nuance, abstract thought, and critical thinking to look beyond the text and engage with the story on a deeper intellectual or philosophical level. It's basically the media equivalent of the Sharingan. Once you unlock it, you start to see fiction differently. You will start to see the characters not just as what they are, but also what they represent in the story. You won't just look at Freyan as an elf, you will start to think about why she's an elf, what that represents, and how it connects to the rest of the world. And when you start doing that with everything in the story, whether it's characters, locations, magic, monsters, events, or dialogue, you will start to notice patterns and complementary ideas. The better those elements fit, the more likely the story will be engaging and it'll have more depth. And if those elements don't fit neatly or contradict each other, we typically see those stories as bad stories. Reading and understanding subtext is a crucial skill for anyone looking to analyze stories. Due to its interpretive nature, not every subtext reading will be consistent among people. However, I typically find that when you analyze media and the story elements don't fit, it's either that the writing is bad or your interpretation is bad. That's why it's so important to discuss these interpretations with your peers. Consider joining my Discord channel if you want to do that. If I had to use one word to describe the strongest part of Soso no Freerin's writing, it would be focus. As I mentioned before, all elements of the show seem to fit around the few ideas that the writer, Kanahito Yamada, is trying to explore. It's refreshing to see a writer who can expand on the fictional world in different ways without losing focus on the core elements that they started with. While the show presents an overarching goal, which is to reach end, it's more about the journey than the destination. With every stop the heroes make, there's something for them to learn or gain, and the creator focuses exactly on that by setting up obstacles that motivate their external and internal growth. Not only that, because this is Freer and Second Journey, the show can contrast them both to indicate change in the character's perspective, as well as recontextualize the events of the first one. All great stuff, but let's say you're a new writer. How would you make sure that your story stays focused and on track with your goal? Planning the story out helps, and there are many ways to do it, but I prefer using concept, to keep stories focused. What, a concept. what do I mean by concept? Well, to me, the term has similarities with the words like theme, logline, premise, and topic. While each of these terms has a unique purpose, they all serve to answer the question, what is the story about? Knowing the answer to that question early is very useful because it offers a strong foundation for your world as well as guidance to where your story should go. It sounds pretty obvious, like duh, right? But surprisingly, a lot of new writers don't do that. If you ever had to sit through a pitch meeting, or just heard someone pitch their story, you probably came across creators just babbling on about how cool their characters are, how intricate their world is, or maybe some twist. Scott and I do have this sweet movie idea about a dude who has guns for hands, and we have the first 20 pages written, so... But no matter how much they talk, they never seem to tell you what the story is actually about. The guy has guns for hands. 
my rule of thumb is, if you can't summarize your story in one or two sentences, you have no story. And those previously mentioned terms are used to do just that. And when I say, what is the story about, I don't mean the surface level summary like, Elf Mage travels through a fantasy realm and kills demons. That is a pretty useless summary because it doesn't actually give you any direction or indication where the story should go. It's pretty aimless. I prefer to use concepts to break down the story into only the essential components, so in Soson or Freyan's case, it would be something like, after being too late to realize the importance of friends in her life, the hero sets off on a journey to reconnect with them and gain new ones along the way. By doing this, she gains a better understanding of others and herself. That's it, no mention of specific characters, settings, powers or anything. What I like is that you can apply this concept to any setting and it would still be a familiar and relatable story to your audience. You see, I'm trying to understand jealousy, it's a new concept to me. And trust me, pitching your idea is much easier if it manages to be relatable. Not only that, it already hints at the potential themes that the story could explore. Themes are good to have, but I also find them a bit too broad to guide the story. But once you have the concept nailed down, you can refer to it when thinking about what characters to add or where you can take the story. Simply answer the question, does X fit the concept of my story? If it doesn't, you don't need it. or you need to change it to better fit the concept. You don't have to start with the concept first. If you start with characters or setting, you can deconstruct those elements to find the concept that would fit them best. Initially, Freyan was planned to be a gag comedy manga about an elf obsessed with killing demons, which does sound extremely generic, so I'm glad Yamada uncovered more depth in the setting she was working on. That depth is typically where you'll find the subtext, because the writer typically has foresight into where the story will go, how it will end and what the themes are, they can use that knowledge to add more meaning and significance to the characters and events. And when you get right down to it, a story is just that. A collection of closely curated scenes that the author deemed most relevant to express their ideas. That's why subtext is so important. If you ignore the significance of those scenes or those story elements, you will only get a very surface level understanding of the story. It doesn't mean you won't enjoy it. In most cases, audience will still engage with those elements on a subconscious level, but articulating beyond I like it, it's good, or the characters are really cool and complex will be a challenge. So with all that out of the way, let's take a look at some of the significant elements in Soso no Freerin. Kanehito Yamada took full advantage of the elf mythology to express a very human issue. Yeah, sometimes people don't realize how important others are to them until it's too late. And sometimes it does take a journey, whether literal or metaphorical, to understand and connect them better. In Freeran's case, her inability to connect with human characters is correlated to her being an elf. Elves can live for thousands of years, so 10 or even 100 years is a relatively short time for them. So it makes sense that spending 10 years with someone is rather inconsequential to them on the grand scale of things. You will find the same ideas explored in Amazon's Invincible with Viltrumites, albeit with a little less subtlety. Viltrumite DNA is so pure, you're nearly full-blooded. You'll live for thousands of years. Everyone you know and love will be gone before you even look 30. But I think the show makes it pretty clear that it has to do more with her emotional detachment rather than her longevity. Freerin seems to have a photographic memory, so it's not like those 10 years just went by in an instant. She clearly remembers every moment, but what she's learning to do now is to understand their value and recontextualize their significance in her life and the lives of others. Having Freerin be an elf in this predominantly human world also sets her up as an outsider. It indicates to the audience a sense of otherness and complements Freerin's goals to better understand humans because, well, she isn't one. This isn't your world. It's theirs. In episode 1, the show establishes that Freerin is rather dismissive of the time she spent with her party and the party justifies her outlook by pointing out that they can't fully understand elves and the way they think. While we don't see a lot of elves in the show, the ones that we do see share similarities with Freerin. They appear to be driven by their passions or interests and don't consciously put value on the humans in their lives. I say consciously because despite Freerin and Ciri both acting dismissive towards humans, neither can help but grow attached to them. This is why the funeral scene establishes a fundamental character change for Freerin. At the start, she appears to be a rational and stoic character who seems cold, blunt and dismissive. She uses her longevity and calculated reasoning as an excuse not to build relationships and undermine their significance. I do love your mother, but she's more like a, a pet to me. A pet? However, during Himmel's funeral, we start to see a different side of Freerin, a side she may not even be aware of. The show really tries to emphasize this point by the way Freerin is trying to keep her emotions in. 
She even tries to rationalize why she shouldn't be feeling these emotions as they continue to take over. Think, Mark! You'll outlast every fragile, insignificant being on this planet. Which is why I really like the shot of Heiter and Eisen putting their hands on her at that moment. They are comforting her, yes, but the shot also indicates them embracing her into their world. At that moment, she was no longer an outsider. She was just as human as anyone else at that funeral. We can infer that this was the first time she ever had this overwhelming outburst of emotions, and it kicks off her new goal to understand humans better. Dad. However, I think this journey is more about her trying to better understand herself and her place among humans, because it's pretty clear that the 10 year journey has changed her without her realizing it. But now that she's aware of it, she sets off to actively learn about humans, because inevitably, she's starting to become more like them. For the most part, picking the right setting for your story can be a fairly straightforward task, and you can pretty much tell any story in any setting. But you may find that some settings work better to deliver a certain type of story. A modern day setting provides a familiar world and allows the writer to focus more on character drama. A sci-fi setting works better as an exploration of the future while addressing the current day issues. Meanwhile, I would probably describe fantasy as a place for allegory to thrive, where ideas take on a more physical form within the world and where characters take on more representative roles to simplify often very complicated concepts. Think fables or fairy tales. They are full of surprisingly complex ideas, yet they are simple enough for all ages to understand and engage with. So So No Frieren is no different in that regard. The show uses a lot of fantasy tropes to create easily identifiable characters and their dynamics. The first hero's party maintains a very traditional adventuring party dynamic, with Himmel being the charismatic heroic leader, Heiter being the party's healer and spiritual support, Aizen being the party's tank, and Frieren being the level-headed mage. But as the show progresses, we can see the author expanding these characters beyond their tropes and even makes a point to highlight that. Himmel himself says he doesn't want people to see them as just fairy tales, and the show doesn't either. Throughout the show, we see each party member struggling to fulfill those roles. We see the wise and level-headed mage fall for an obvious trap, we see the frontliner in his moment of fear, the spiritual guide succumb to his vices, and the heroic leader making mistakes and not living up to the legend. These scenes create a juxtaposition between the romanticized idea of the heroes that the world perceives and the reality that Freon reveals to us through flashbacks. These characters have very human wants and flaws and the show focuses on them through the fantasy context. It's safe to say that it's very much a character-driven show that prioritizes exploring characters more than the actual quest. So if the show intends to explore characters, you can also start to analyze the fantasy elements through that intention. For example, Let's take a look at the magic system. While going into Freyan's magic system may take too long, I do want to advise you to pay attention to how the characters use their magic and what kind of magic they are using because I think it tells a lot about them. What's the significance of Fern knowing how to use offensive magic faster than Freyran? It's a specific plot point that is showcased throughout the show. The interpretation I like is that it's meant to contrast their personalities. Freyran is never in a rush. That's a pretty defined character trait. But we also know that she's incredibly powerful due to her years of experience as a mage. And that's representative of her Zoltrak. It's slow to charge, but incredibly powerful. Meanwhile, what do we know about Fern? Well, what about the fact that she had to learn her magic under a time limit? She pushed herself to become a real mage before Heiter's death. So there was always a sense of urgency the whole time she was training. And that sense of urgency stays with her even after she goes on a quest with Freyren. She doesn't let Freyren dawdle around at her usual pace. While Fern does appear similarly stoic as Freyren, there is always a sense of decisiveness and efficiency, and the way she wins battles is representative of that. She uses the bare minimum, defensive magic, offensive magic, and levitation for movement. With nothing else to think about, she can just use her Soul Track 47. You can especially find how magic correlates to their users in the Mage Exam arc. One of the clearest one is Richter. The guy doesn't want friends and constantly rejects anyone attempting to bond with him. He appears rude and arrogant, even if there are hints that he's a pretty nice guy. It may just be a knack to keep people away from him. And what's his main form of magic? He builds walls around himself and uses ground attacks to literally push people away. I don't even know how you could make this metaphor even more obvious. Or how about Levine's and Kane's magical abilities being so closely linked together to identify the close bond they have with one another? Interestingly enough, I felt bad when one of them failed the exam because the show set up their constant rivalry as an important part of their dynamic, so I knew that one passing the other would significantly impact their relationship. It's even more significant that it was Connie who passed, because she was portrayed as the less confident mage who needed Levine's guidance. 
Luckily, it was a temporary thing, as Connie fails the third test and gets brought back to Levine's level. It makes sense though, the two needed one another, so there was no way Connie would have succeeded on her own. Another important factor to point out is Levine's and Canny's parallel to Freyan and Fern. While the show is fairly subtle about it, there's a dynamic change between Freyan and Fern, as both are coming to terms that Fern will surpass Freyan, both in magic and understanding humans. Fern can essentially be seen as the human version of Freyan. Her village was destroyed when she was a child, she was also taken in by a legendary mage, and she shares a lot of personality traits with Freyan. But the speed at which Fern develops her skills and emotional maturity contrasts Freyan's stagnant growth. The mage arc was setting up the idea that Fern had possibly outgrown Freyran and didn't need her anymore. The first exam separates the two to showcase that Fern can take care of herself and the second exam had Fern fight the clone of Freyran. Even the destruction of her staff can be seen as an indication of Fern outgrowing it. Think back how big the staff was when we first saw Fern holding it and how she grew to master it. But now it's destroyed, allowing her to get a new staff, a new mentor and a new life. All of which she's not willing to do just yet as she gets her old staff repaired and returns to Freerun, though now she has the knowledge that she's no longer a child dependent on Freerun to survive. You can also find a lot of hidden meaning behind the monsters that Freerun and her party face, as each one of them has a narrative purpose and serves to develop the characters and the themes further. The powers and nature of these monsters are way too unique to just be cool ideas for the heroes to fight, which means that the author intends these monsters to fulfill a duty beyond just being a threat. It's always refreshing to see that, as opposed to just having a monster that looks cool. Let's take a look at some of the main enemies Freyrin goes up against. Qual. Qual was a fierce demon who created the powerful spell known as Zoltrak. He was feared by many adventures and even Freyrin and her first party weren't strong enough to beat him, so she sealed him off in stone instead. Now, Freyrin returns to the sealed monster to defeat him for good. As the first demon of the show, Qual is shown as a giant, monstrous creature with legends told about his power. However, he can be interpreted as an allegory for stagnation. He's literally sealed in stone, unable to grow or develop his skills further. So when Freyrin faces him again 80 years later, this once legendary demon is nothing more than a monster with basic offensive spells. And despite him holding his own at the start, he does lose very quickly. In Freyrin's case, it's a cautionary tale about what happens if she doesn't continue to grow as a mage and as a person. She has also gained legendary status for her achievements, but if 80 years can make Qual's power obsolete, Freerun may find herself obsolete just as fast. The theme of stagnation is also noticeable in Fern, who appears to be anxious to fight Qual after hearing just how powerful he is. Yet, her anxiety came from a lack of knowledge as Fern didn't do the necessary reading to understand what kind of threat she's facing. That's why after they defeat Qual, we cut straight to Fern reading a book while Freerun is receiving praise from the villagers. I really like the shot as it indicates that Fern not only learned the importance of being well read, but also accepted the fact that she did not perform as well as she could have. It also reveals a potential reason why Freyrn is often seen reading. The Einzim. Monsters that take the appearance of dead loved ones to lure them into the forest. Freyrn and Fern have to face them and both see the most important people in their lives. For Fern, it's Heiter, the priest that adopted her. And for Freyrn, it's Himmel. Heiter can be seen as a representation of Fern's grief, as she's not willing to let go of him yet. She knows it's not the real Heiter, and yet, she can't force herself to attack either. For Freyrn, she was expecting to see her mentor. But instead, she got Himmel, visually indicating that Himmel has made the greatest impact in her life, even if she didn't think of it like that. What I like about this contrast is that it indicates both of their flaws and what they have to overcome on their adventure. Fern still lacks combat experience and lets her feelings hold her back from taking decisive action. Meanwhile, Freyrn is still cold and rational, lacking that human understanding of emotion and connection. Trend. Hmm, Freyrn still likes humanity and connection to others? I wonder if there's a monster that could represent the dangers of that moral inefficiency and highlight their incompatibility within human society. Oh wait, there is. The demons. Demons are one of the main threats in this world, but unlike the demons in other stories, these ones seem to be a bit more intricate. While their actions can be seen as evil, I wouldn't call them evil. They don't have the same concept of morality and empathy. In fact, it seems like they are biologically incapable of feeling empathy, so their actions can be driven by malice. However, they are intelligent creatures that can cooperate, 
even if it seems to only be driven by personal goals and ambitions. By all accounts, their kind is as intelligent and sophisticated as humans, but that lack of empathy makes them so incompatible with humans that the only solution for them both is to kill or be killed. Thematically, in a story all about human connections, I think it's very appropriate to have villains who are incapable of having them, and while Freon has plenty of reason to slay demons, I think there's something more metaphorical about Freon destroying demons who don't value human life. Maybe it's not just external demons that she's battling. But I hope you got an idea of what I mean by focus. The characters, the locations, the magic, the monsters, all connect to represent something that fits the show's themes or concept. I could analyze all the subtext that the show provides for hours and hours, and that's a sign of just how deep the storytelling goes. Pretty much everything fits neatly, and you can see the intentionality pretty clearly if you look close enough. You can debate how well it succeeds at conveying those ideas, or argue over which interpretation is more accurate, but the fact that there is even something deeper to analyze already earns praise from me. Images are very powerful, I should say, and we have to start to begin to teach younger people how to use them, and what they, and at least to begin to understand to interpret them. Since Soso no Freeran is both a manga and an anime, they benefit from another layer of depth through the use of visual storytelling. While I understand the visual storytelling techniques used in the manga will be different from those in the anime, I still found that the anime utilized it a lot better by giving certain scenes more time and thought to highlight their importance in the story. While animation can offer a lot more creative options, it doesn't inherently make anime superior to manga. It's still highly dependent on the effective execution of those techniques within the medium, but you will be happy to know that Soso no Freeran is in the hands of a director and creative team who understands the fundamentals of film language and use it to great effect. While I use film language and visual storytelling interchangeably, I do that in the context of movies and animation. While art and photography use practically all the same visual language grammar, film language has a layer that comes with motion and other filmmaking techniques that static images can't have. It's a significant difference that can alter the way we interpret visuals. Whatever this guy is babbling about visuals being unable to carry the story is flat out wrong. A show cannot be carried by visuals alone, even though many will claim that it's carried by the animation. Opinions like these are the reason why we have expository dialogue nowadays. I'm scared of my power. I'm scared of being alone. Soso no Freeran goes out of its way to tell a story through visuals, and its intent behind the shots is pretty apparent. It's not just trying to look pretty and be well animated. But I can see why he might say that though. It's a rarity to see such plentiful use of film language in anime, so it's easy to look past all the details that the director, Keishiro Saito, added to the show. It's especially difficult if you haven't been taught how to read and interpret film language. However, even if one is unaware of the film language techniques they're watching, they're still engaging with them. That's one of the biggest reasons why movies and animation can have such a profound emotional impact on people. If you ever cried at a movie, you know what I mean. It's not just the writing that is doing that. There is a psychology behind how we perceive visuals, which has been studied and explored for many decades. A young person wants to express themselves and take a, a video camera and go out. They're going to find that they have to frame the image. And in framing the image, they're going to find that they have to interpret what they want to say to an audience. Now, how do you point the audience's eye to look where you want them to look and to get the point, the emotional and psychological point that you want to get across to them? They're going to have to make that decision. The real making of the filmmakers when they look to that viewfinder. The person that's mainly responsible for knowing film language is the director. The director would go through the script, analyze it, and translate it into a visual format that they believe will capture the tone and emotion of the scene most effectively. And great directors are extremely meticulous about these things. Put the camera in between the picnic table, the extras, and the terry. I was just getting to learn Quentin Tarantino. So he was, again, a tyrant. Tyrant in the sense that is he insist on every word oh, being yeah. just the way he wrote it? But that's what you want. Don't you want the freedom to also kind of add nah, your twist? Not no? with him. You can pretty much instantly tell when a director has a great vision and when it's just another paycheck. Going back to Mr. Otaku Spirit's point, if I could give it a good faith interpretation, I think he means that the visuals are there to support the writing. So if the writing is bad, it won't matter how beautiful the animation or the cinematography is. That's actually very true. A director is there to make sure that the visuals support the goal of the story. If the story is poorly written to begin with, it will be difficult for the director to translate it into good film language. A film can look good and have stunning visuals, but if those visuals don't have a lot of narrative meaning behind them, they can just be considered spectacle rather than film language. 
Luckily, Sosa Interferon is a great anime to learn to read and interpret film language. It's not pushing the cinematic boundary so much that it would stump those who are new to film studies, but man, it's so nice to see film language being used competently to support the goal of the writing. But instead of just saying that film language exists, how about I analyze a few scenes to show how I approach interpreting visual storytelling and what you should look out for when doing it yourself. Let me put it this way. If subtext is the Sharingan, then film language is the Mangekyo Sharingan. It's another level of analysis that allows you to analyze not just what's presented, but how it's presented. From what I saw, Keishiro Saito seems to be a big fan of blocking. In film terms, blocking means where the characters are positioned within the frame, which filmmakers can use to establish relationships, power dynamics, or character development. When it comes to power dynamics, a good example is when Ubel is talking to Zensei. See how the camera is positioned to make Zenzi appear smaller and Ubel more intimidating. Meanwhile, when Farin is fighting her clone, there are a lot more two shots where they're both at the same level to visually represent that they are evenly matched. Also, take note how close both Freerans are within the frame. Putting the characters close to one another is typically used to create a level of intimacy. Saito uses this to highlight how locked in both Freerans are to one another, which makes Fern's interference more significant. Even at the start of the battle, the distance between the Freerans and Fern makes Fern appear completely unrelated to the battle. There's a very important bit of subtext behind this battle, but I'll let you figure it out yourself. I'd love to hear your interpretations in the comments. I'll even hard the ones that I think are close to my interpretation. Saito also tends to use objects as dividers or confines as a way to better represent the conflict in the story or a character's mental state. Episode 2 is probably the best example. This is Fern's first adventure with Freerun after Hydra's death, so she's very much dependent on Freerun and sticks close to her the whole time. This is visually represented in this shot where Freerun and Fern are framed inside a small window frame. But as the story progresses, there are more dividers between them as Fern gradually shows concern over the time it takes to complete their quest. She doesn't want to leave Freerun, but she doesn't want to waste her time in this village looking for flowers either. She feels trapped. And how is that represented through blocking? By using the railing to isolate Fern. The railing can even be interpreted as prison bars. The blue flowers on the left are intentionally placed there too. A similar motif can be seen in episode 7, when Freerun is locked away in a dungeon. Notice the angle used for Freerun's and Fern's conversation? It's not quite clear who is behind bars, because in essence, they both are. That's why we see Fern grip the bars when talking about Freerun wasting time, because again, it's Fern's time being wasted too. The show also tends to use the same compositions to create a link between two different scenes. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. It can sometimes have a match cut where it would cut between two scenes that match the same composition. These repeated compositions are used in different ways. It can be a way to easily reveal a character's emotional state, as we see in the match cut of Zense. Yes, we understand that the previous scene was a flashback, but the match cut indicates that she's having the same feelings that she did in that scene. And we already know what these feelings are, as the flashback scene sets Ubel up as a dangerous and intimidating character. We have the same shot composition when Stark is learning from Lord Orden as we did when he was learning on his own and being judged by the other warriors, visually revealing that Stark's feelings of inadequacy are still haunting him. While some may argue that matching shots can be there as a budget saving technique, I think it's quite obvious when it's intended to have more significance than that. Saito also tends to utilize the space in the frame to enhance the story. Whenever we see a strange gap, there is likely meaning behind it. I already talked about the use of space in my previous Freerun videos, but there are many other ways to utilize it. Going back to Ubel and Zenze, look at this wide shot and how much free space there is. What does that tell you? To me, the show wants to make Zenze appear cornered and Ubel taking a much more dominant position. So Sonofrian also makes use of carefully placed close-ups. A close-up is usually used to guide the viewer to some important detail that the filmmaker wants them to pay attention to. You can see a few of those in Fern's battle with Lord Lugner. They are used to build tension in a similar way that western movies used to during Mexican standoff scenes. I'm also happy to tell you that Soso no Freen uses lighting, especially diegetic lighting, to better capture the tone of the scene. For example, you can notice how Lord Orden and Stark walk past the window and the colors suddenly fade alongside Stark's expression. Since Lord Orden mentioned Stark's village, we can infer that something bad happened to the village without needing to go into the backstory again. It's a little detail, but extremely intentional. I could go on and on, but I wouldn't want to ruin all the fun. I highly recommend you try to analyze a few scenes and interpret the meaning that they are trying to capture and how they use film language to do so. If you want a bit of homework, do it for the Stark and Fern dance scene in episode 15. There's a ton of easily detectable visual storytelling going on in that scene alone. Let me know in the comments what you can find.
Despite my praise for the show's use of film language, it's still not without its flaws. While how much they affect your enjoyment of the show is subjective, I feel there are some observations I'd like to point out regarding visual storytelling. One of my personal criticisms would be the overabundance of emotionally distant and stoic characters in the show. The show seems to be trying to establish Freyan as an outsider in the society by the way others perceive her and the choices she makes. However, visually the way she acts doesn't appear too different from many other characters who also seem stoic and emotionally distant. Sure, I don't think Freyan needs to be as alien as Rey from Neon Genesis Evangelion. Please forgive me. In situations like these, I don't know how to respond or act. Smiling would be a good start. But at the moment, her quest to better understand humans is undermined when the human characters look and act like Freerin. Contrasting characters could help mitigate that, and I think that's what Freerin had in the first party. Himmel, Heiter, and Eisen were a lively bunch who weren't afraid to be fun, playful, and open, which made Freerin stand out more as the odd one out. But with this new party, we don't have that contrast. Freerin is basically Freerin 2.0, and Stark is pretty much the butt of all the jokes. Stark seems to be there only to learn rather than teach. And while the show is hinting at him becoming a hero, to me, he doesn't have the charisma of Himmel. One way this trio could work is if Fern and Stark grow to become more human for Freeran to learn from. But honestly, I don't see it. Especially when the characters outside the party and even the demons appear to act very similar to everyone else, establishing a norm that Freeran is already part of. I understand it's cool to have characters stay calm and collected even at dire times, and it does make the rare moments when they do emote stand out more. But I feel like the creators are a bit too economical with those expressions. Yeah, it's better than loud and obnoxious characters who don't know when to shut up. <laughs> but I was still looking for a bigger distinction between the characters we meet on this journey. I think the show could have used emotions and battles a lot more to create a better contrast between these characters. Like saying the battle between Fern and Lugner, Fern could have emoted a lot more to contrast Lugner's lack of emotion, thus building up the distinction between humans and demons. If you want to see a good example of that, watch Vegeta's and Android 18's fight in Dragon Ball Z. You can see the clear distinction between the emotional and passionate fighting of Vegeta contrast against the calm and calculated style of Android 18. I feel like Sosun or Fern could have benefited from that a lot. She doesn't have to do a Super Saiyan scream, but I don't know, frown, get a bit angry. You are fighting one of the creatures that destroy your village and your family. You don't have to go all Khabib on him. I watch his eyes, I feel nothing. Right now, they made Fern way too competent and calculated in what is her first solo battle against the demon. Taking damage is also fairly inconsistent in the show, and a missed opportunity to develop the characters. For example, I can't really tell if demons feel pain or not. Some get their hands sliced off and feel nothing, others wince at a scratch, but also stay perfectly stoic when they lose half of their body. Fern also tanks an impalement wound like it was nothing. I feel nothing. I expect Freeran not to mind that kind of injury, because she's a veteran at this point, but since when does Fern have such a high pain tolerance? Meanwhile Stark, the party's tank, is groaning at every cut. <laughs> I don't know, I feel like it was a missed opportunity. Also, I don't want to be labeled a demon apologist again, but I can confidently say that this Screen Rant article by Joshua Fox is wrong. Demons in Freeran are not simple, basic, or just pure evil. If anything, a lot of the backstories involving demons are more tragic than evil. It's a shame I didn't bring this up in my previous video, but while Stark was fighting Linny, she explains that she learns her moves by watching other warriors, one of which was Aizen. But look at the circumstances that she was watching him. She's a child watching a warrior slaughter all her kin. Sure, she may not have the empathy to feel sad for her fallen demon kind, but as the audience, we shouldn't ignore the intention behind the shot. For our Sosun or Freeran, we have seen many children orphaned after a demon attack. So doesn't it strike you as weird when we see the same scenario from a demon's perspective? Or what about this shot of Linny grasping for the light of the moon before bursting into ashes? Is that really how an evil villain's death is normally shown? Either the creators fail to capture the basic villainy of demons, or they're trying to add a layer of complexity to them. I'm going with the latter. I also want to address some of the common critiques regarding pacing and exposition. The pacing part is more subjective as I personally like the slower pace. It gives you more time to appreciate the short composition and creates a feeling of calm. In Soso no Freeran, we are in no hurry. There's no end of the world catastrophe, no one needs to be saved right away. The pacing creates an atmosphere that allows the characters and the audience to be more introspective of the smaller things that are happening, like relationships being established or slice of life moments that would be otherwise ignored if there was a bunch of demons to fight all the time. Now that I think about it, I never felt like we stayed too long in one particular location. Heck, think how much we experienced in the first episode, and yet, it doesn't feel like we rushed it at all. The show is just very precise with what needs to be told and how, so you get all the information you need without wasting time on unnecessary stuff. 
Honestly, compare that episode to the first episode of Centaur World and you'll know the difference between good pacing and bad pacing. Yeah, she also said that she needed to get back to some sort of war that she was in the middle of because she and a rat person thing. As for exposition, I don't think there's any more exposition than your typical anime, but I know I shouldn't use that fact to justify it being there. I guess my main critique of exposition would be the constant clarification or characters highlighting someone's mood. When we see a shot of a character with a butler and a carriage, I don't think we need another character saying that it's a noble. Or if we see one character being angry, we don't need the other saying she's angry. It's kind of there already. If we see it, there's no need to describe it. Inner monologues seem rather unnecessary too. I understand the creator is using them to highlight the stakes or present the character's thought process as they assess the situation. But often, there's so much detailed visual information in the shots, a keen observer would pick up all the information they need. For example, in the first part of episode 15, Sain is fighting a planned creature that put a sleeping curse on the town. Stark, Fern and Freeran have all been put out of commission, leaving Sain to fight alone. If you watch this battle, you will hear Sain inner monologuing about the stakes, the time he has left, the problem and the potential solution. However, all that information is already given to us through visuals. We see the plant protecting its head from Sain's attacks, suggesting vulnerability. We see the reflection in the petals to indicate that they possess reflective abilities. The damage that the magical attack causes would indicate the threat a missed attack could have on them and the town. With a glance at Freyrn, we establish that he thinks she could defeat the enemy. Even the limited time could be indicated through Sain's vision getting blurrier, as he's also being affected by the curse. A flashback of Freyrn telling him not to fight alone would allow the audience to infer that he needs to learn to trust her. With a bit of tweaking, it's very possible to have the scene without any monologue whatsoever. On one hand, this is praise for visual storytelling, on the other hand, it's a critique for exposition. Where I don't mind expository dialogue is when characters are explaining political issues, sharing stories or information, since they are used to present context that the audience will use to understand certain character behaviors and visual storytelling. For example, in episode 14, Sain gives exposition about the mirror lotus and what it means, but how that information changes the behavior of Stark and Fern is shown through visuals and subtext. That information also provides the audience with context for Freyrn's ring and why it's important too. Sure, you can also find less expository ways to convey that information, but as it is now, it's not too egregious. What I find interesting is the show does give you moments where it lets the visuals speak more than the dialogue, so the creators aren't completely afraid of letting the audience think for themselves, but I wish they kind of did that more often. Of course, there's always a risk that you may alienate your audience that may not pick up on the film language, but that's the risk that turns a show into a masterpiece. Now that I've buttered you up with the positives, I can go into the less great aspects of Sosa no Freeran. Don't worry, these observations should not deter you from giving this anime a shot. But it's enough to make me question its rankings compared to the anime greats like Psycho Pass, Death Note, or A Place Further in the Universe. Don't get me wrong, Soso no Freeran is an exceptional anime, but boy is it trying not to be. Every time I see a masterfully done scene that goes beyond the typical fantasy anime, that excitement is vaporized by the same old, tired fantasy tropes, running gags, fan service, and plot beats. The repetitive plot beats are such a big issue, I think that's the main reason why I can't call the show a masterpiece. You may find that the show starts to feel a bit samey once you pick up on the same patterns occurring again and again. It's not a huge problem from the storytelling aspect and does provide a calm and familiar pace. It sets the show up to be more of a quest of the week type of anime with a few 3-5 episode arcs when things get serious. All good and perfectly workable, yes, but by the 10th time you see the same structure it does feel more like a meme. Miss Freeran, how long do we have to walk? I'm hungry. Yeah Freeran, I'm hungry too. We're not halfway through the episode yet, still have to spend the next 10 minutes talking and doing exposition for the audience. The camera is going to do a quick zoom in and insert sad flashback number one. When I was hungry back then, Himmel the hero brought me to Costco to get the chicken bake. Would it be improved that they had variety? Depends on how they do it. Right now, it feels like they're playing it safe with the story structure. They clearly got the format nailed down and they're trying to make the most out of it. But to me, that unwillingness to push boundaries is what I think holds the show from actually being a masterpiece. And if you hate repetition, don't get me started on the characters and their running gags. While I'm sure many are bursting out laughing every time these running gags appear, I'm getting slightly miffed by how frequently they show up. Imagine if, in The Lord of the Rings, you have Pippin ask about second breakfast. What about second breakfast? But he does that three times per movie. Mary. What about second breakfast? The Yanks have not troubled about the wars of men and wizards. What about second breakfast? I think by the third time you toss a pan at him, right? I understand that the purpose of running gags is that they keep running, but there's always opportunities to make them more unique and creative each time, and not just repeat them beat for beat. Ah! 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 Okay.
I have the same critique for Dragon Ball Z, where every time they do a fusion dance, they have to do the fat version and the skinny version. Really? There are no other versions when someone messes up a fusion? Not only that, these running gags are affecting my understanding of the characters and making them appear more one-dimensional than I would like them to be. Some of these examples include Freeran getting trapped in a mimic chest, Huffy Fern, and Drunk Heiter. Let's start with Freeran's mimic gag. The idea of this gag is that despite her being an overly powerful and extremely wise mage, she keeps falling for the same mimic trap. Throughout the series, we constantly see Freeran stuck inside a mimic's mouth, kicking and begging for help. I know I shouldn't take this gag seriously, but it feels weird to see a thousand year old elf who is typically shown to be extremely knowledgeable getting fooled by a thing that even human characters wouldn't fall for. After the fourth time I saw the mimic gag, I was starting to think that she's into that kind of stuff, like it's some kind of roleplay thing or something. That's the only way I can justify Freeran's sudden loss of intelligence and mental regression. She explains that there's always a tiny chance of finding a rare grimoire, so she will always go for the chest, even if it's most likely a mimic. But seriously, is there no way of double checking first? You don't have to Zoltrak it, just poke it with a stick or give it a stab. I don't think a nudge with a blade would damage the grimoire. There are a million ways to safely examine the chest, so the only reasonable conclusion is that she likes the gamble and the penalty for it. You can say I'm overthinking this, but it was starting to turn into a problem. When Freyrn and the other mages were planning to defeat the Freyrn clone, I was ready to suggest that they should just toss a mimic into the room. Just wait for the Freyrn clone to go after it, and then attack it when it's trapped. It's an easy exploitable weakness that anyone with the half a brain could utilize. Too bad Freyrn probably destroyed all the mimics in the dungeon. Would have been a funny joke to add. Getting trapped by mimics is a running gag for Freyrn, but her sudden stupidity shouldn't be. I feel like the creators could have given her flaws that wouldn't contradict her intelligence and skills. Or at least find a better way to justify it. All they had to do was explain that using magic or checking for mimics ruins the frill and avoiding the punishment of getting slimed would also make it less fun. It's weird, but at least then it works. Anyway, let's do Hyter next. Whenever we see Hyter in flashbacks, we very often see him drunk or out of commission. Once again, it's a running gag, but we need to see him actually being competent every now and then. Otherwise, people will start to think that Hyter was a useless party member. Hyter is typically portrayed as a man of wisdom, but I doubt that was the only thing he did. Could he fight? Did he provide magical support like Sign? Or was he just drunk the majority of the adventure and let the other teammates do all the heavy lifting? It's a good thing that Hyter is a likable guy, so it's easy to forgive his drunkenness. But still, I think they need to tone it down and show off Hyter as being an active and competent party member from time to time. Show me at least one battle when he's not drunk. Lastly, we have Pouty Fern. I find it quite cute and endearing the first time, but when I saw it again and again and again, I was starting to get more annoyed by it, especially since her huff ends up derailing the rest of the episode as the quest becomes finding a way to stop Fern from pouting. Is there no other way to get the characters to go out? Ever since the first proper pouting session in episode 14, she's been weaponizing this thing like Darth Vader's force choke. It's a childish thing to do for someone who is considered the mature one of the group. And yes, Fern is still technically young, but she has always been far more mature for her age, even as a kid. One could interpret the sudden childishness as a sign that she's starting to relax more and show more of her true feelings, rather than keep them to herself. I wouldn't mind that if it didn't hog so much screen time. I also feel like we're not going to see Freyrn showing her more emotional side until we reach End and reunite with Himmel for one last time, which is kind of a disappointment. Remember when I talked about the significance of the funeral scene and how it fundamentally changed Freyrn? As the show progresses, we don't explore that side of Freyrn as much. Sure, she has some introspection through flashbacks, but we never see her emotions kicking in, nor her struggling to hold her emotions like she did in episode 1 or 2. In fact, in episode 5, she blasts Himmel in the face. It does signify the end of her grieving, but it doesn't mean the show couldn't explore Freyan's more emotional side in other ways. Maybe there's another party who loses a teammate, and Freyan can empathize with their loss. Or maybe her better understanding of loss makes her more proactive when trying to save lives, and thus she starts acting more like Himmel the hero. But no, in episode 7 she seems quite content with leaving a town to its demise. And in episode 13, she's pondering whether to save a priest even after he told her a very relatable story about friendship. Save him, you psycho. Use levitation, get a branch, something, anything. You shouldn't be stumped by this. In episode 14, you could have shown a bit more desperation in Freyan's search for the ring. She doesn't need to cry over it, but it could have been another moment of self-reflection. Her rationale about the ring not being the only thing she got from Himmel would be there, but her emotions would urge her to keep looking and with each passing day, she may start to feel a familiar heartache like she's losing Himmel again. Would have been nice to see her getting a better understanding of sentimental value that would correlate to what Himmel said in episode 1, rather than Fern just telling Freerin that it's important. What we got wasn't bad, but it's far from being at the same level as the first two episodes, and I guess that's my problem. I can see remnants of the gag comedy manga still lurking inside Sosuno Freerin. It's a strange situation where the writer and director clearly had some pretty deep and thought out ideas they wanted to explore, 
but also decided to keep the silly, generic fantasy anime tropes. And I'm not entirely sure that works. I feel like they already had a strong hook, being an exploration of relationships, growth, loss, and regret, and didn't need to do the gag comedy part. A bit of comic relief does do wonders not to make the show too miserable, but I was kind of expecting the same level of comedy as the drama, but I don't think we got anything like that. But what we do get is a very pleasant atmosphere and very likable characters to go on this high fantasy adventure with. What Keiichiro Saito and Kanehito Yamada both capture is a living, breathing world filled with pleasant people who just want to live their lives. The show doesn't have a huge amount of stakes. Sure, there are monsters and demons to fight, but for the most part, it's more about traveling to new locations, meeting new people, maybe helping an elderly lady with her chores. There's no urgency in this adventure. It's a lot like playing Skyrim. There is Alduin and the Civil War, but I know many players just ignored the main questline and simply enjoyed exploring the world, and I think there's something wholesome to gain from that. I suppose a point of praise would be that Soso no Frien captures the tone of traditional fantasy TTRPG adventures. A lot of these episodes could work as Dungeons and Dragons campaigns. Like episode 14, where the party needs to investigate a town that was put under a sleeping curse. They track down the source and have to fight a boss monster. The magic system, music, shot composition, and party-focused combat mechanics all work to create authentic classical fantasy atmosphere. I'd even argue that Sosonofrian is actually the best depiction of Dungeons and Dragons. Just compare Sosonofrian with something like Vox Machina and tell me which one feels more like D&D. And I'm talking about a classical D&D adventure, not like a meme-based meta game or something. What I want to give to just bang a dragon right now. What I'm getting out of the show is that it seems pretty content being a very, very, very well-made fantasy anime and takes the audience along on this adventure. Even the cover art indicates that. We see the main three characters all looking at the viewer as if they're just another party member, and I think that's great. It would explain why so many fans engage with this anime on such an emotional level. Free Rin took me by force. I became obsessed. I couldn't stop watching it. It was an adventure they were part of, and the creators wanted it to be just that. Knowing that though, that kind of emotional attachment is probably going to lead me to get a lot of passionate comments telling I'm wrong. But I'll be honest here, I think we already saw peak Soso no Freerun in the first four episodes. While it still leagues above many anime that came in the past decade, I sense that excitement for this anime will plateau over time, and I'm seeing signs that Soso no Freerun will end up becoming an above average fantasy anime, rather than a masterpiece that it could have been. And hey, hopefully even the diehard Freerun fans will enjoy the insight of this video and will stay open minded to criticism. You've been following us. Why? Okay. I'm about 70% sure she can't hear me, but I think it's time to make myself scarce. Well, this might take a while. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. It took me way too long to make, so I hope it will be useful to some of you. These kind of videos are the reason why you should hit that subscribe button. Oh, and make sure to hit that like button while you're at it too. I'll be doing a post video live stream too, so if you have any questions, I'll be there to answer them. As always, you're welcome to join my Discord if you want to hang out and play some Gothic Phone. And congratulations to the 75% who are right on the poll. I managed to make this video before we hit 10k subscribers. I'm super thrilled that you all subscribed and I hope I can make some great content for you in the future.